There was so much brand new stuff to find out about Apple Silicon yesterday that you guys have questions. Today, we're answering them. I'm Ike David and I simplify Apple so that everything just works for you and if you want the latest Apple news, leaks and rumours every weekday at 12 UTC, like this video, subscribe to the channel and ring my notification bell so you don't miss a thing. If you ring the bell, you can also join the notification squad, you'll get a shout out just like Kirian Dunn. And for the sake of speed today, I am giving Siri the day off so I'm going to be reading your questions and answering them. Thomas E asks, IK of answers, is the screen on the 12 inch iPad Pro worth the upgrade? Do you think 16 gigabytes of RAM on an iPad is overkill? So as with most things, the display quality is subjective. If it makes a difference to you to have those darker blacks and the higher contrast ratio, then absolutely it will be well worth it for you. I don't think that the pricing is gonna come back down. I don't think it's one of these things where they're putting a premium on it to begin with and then it will kind of come back down uh, although that display technology will probably kind of spread out across the range now that also seems fair to me because obviously over time things get more expensive there is inflation things like that are real so this just lets apple get its little price bump in and justify it at the time in terms of 16 gigabytes of RAM being overkill, uh, it doesn't really make any difference. Are there any apps that need 16 gigabytes of RAM to run? No. However, just like with on my Mac Mini, which is running on 8 gigs of RAM, just because my Mac Mini can run any app that I need it to on 8 gigabytes doesn't mean that it wouldn't run better potentially on 16 gigabytes. And the other big advantage of having the extra RAM on an iPad is that when you are switching between apps, it's not having to reload them at all. More of the open apps are being able to be held in RAM and not having to reload anything when you switch backwards and forwards between them. So yes, you will be able to work with bigger projects, but you'll also uh, not be switching between apps and having to reload them from scratch every time. They'll just be held in RAM and ready to go immediately. So it'll be more quality of life improvements than requirements to run things. Next up, Peter Holdman asks, iCave answers, since there are already two variants of the M1, 7 versus 8 GPU cores with the same M1 designation, what do you think about Apple just keeping the M1 name for the additional core chips? That's a really good point, uh, however there is a difference here, the M1 is the M1, the difference between the 7 and 8 core GPU versions is that they are lower binned chips, so they are only making one chip at this point, which is four performance cores, four efficiency cores, and eight GPU cores. It's just that Apple is using some of the chips where one of those GPU cores isn't perfect, disabling it in order to increase yields, so they're not throwing out as many chips as failed, but they're being able to put them into the lower end uh, products. So it's not a different piece of silicon, it is a uh, a full-sized, full-built M1. It's just that with one of those eight cores not working, they disable it so that they can use more of them, which helps them to keep the costs down a little bit because all of those chips that would otherwise have been thrown out are now being used. Um, so I don't think that that's a fair comparison, really, because the additional cores, they're not building M1 with the 10 cores or 12 cores or whatever we're talking about and then only using eight of those cores at the moment. It's a completely different chip design. Team Kinetics asks, IK Vances, can you speculate on how Apple might name or differentiate the different flavors of Apple Silicon? So this is something that we've been talking about for quite some time. Everyone has kind of been assuming M1X being the, uh, the performance version, but it looks like we are gonna have different GPU levels in this. So it might well be that they just keep M1X and then with 16 core GPU or M1X with 32 core GPU, whatever they decide to do, or they could go M1X and M1Z potentially because the difference between the M1X and the M1Z in terms of the old iPads was the additional GPU being enabled, which I know confuses things versus the last question that we answered, but the, again, that wasn't a different chip, it was a variant within the same chip. Um, so that's what I would expect at that point. The other options that I've discussed in the past, potentially M1 Pro, uh, for these higher variants, but I really don't know because I wasn't expecting it until yesterday And then Mark Gurman just came and dumped this new idea all over me next up Bruce Grubb asks I was wondering if Apple will allow target display mode to work again I would really like to get my M1 Mac mini and use my iMac 2013 as a monitor without all the hoop jumping that you need to do I am a hundred percent with you on this one because uh, 
I also have a 2013 iMac sitting right behind this camera. I can't use it for anything really. Uh, I don't think that we are going to be getting target display mode back. The reason for that is that they would only be able to enable it on the very older iMacs, sort of the 2013 and back. So the 5K displays, you can't do it. It's a hardware limitation. It's not something that can be done. Um, and the main reason for that is Thunderbolt. Uh, Thunderbolt was not fast enough to uh, carry it until we got to the Thunderbolt 4, I think, uh, was probably the, the first version that could have been capable of it. Uh, Thunderbolt 2, which is on those displays, can carry it for the 2560 by 1440 uh, resolution, but 5K was just too much to put over a single cable at this point. So the hardware inside the 5K IMAX is not powerful enough to run a target display mode at full resolution. So that's the reason that they wouldn't do that. With the much older displays like the 2013s, they're now beyond being able to run things like Big Sur, so Apple is probably unlikely to be rolling out an update for those, like a firmware update that would allow that again. I think it would have been a great idea. I'm hoping that now with Apple Silicon monitors going forward and Apple Silicon iMacs, that they will allow something similar or they will allow you to use another Mac as a target for the display, but that just comes down to whether Apple decides to enable it. All the hardware is their own now, so there's no reason that they shouldn't, other than the actual technical challenges of their own silicon. John Richardson asks, do you think there will be any major reason for waiting for the iPhone 13 over buying an iPhone 12 now? Good question. There are certainly going to be changes. There's always changes, and I know a lot of people bought the iPhone 12 generation like I did, and a lot of people bought it in the general public at least because it looked different. Now this iPhone 13 or iPhone 12s as we actually expect it to be called is probably not going to look much different. Uh, there will be new colours of course, there will always be things like that, there will be minor cosmetic changes. For example, we're expecting to get a larger camera bump which will be accommodating even bigger lenses. The bigger you make your lenses, the bigger you make your sensors, the more light you can gather, so the images will be better. Uh, rumours that we've been hearing uh, are along the lines of what I was hoping for last year, portrait mode video coming to the next ones. Uh, that would require the LiDAR, I think, in order to give it a good depth map, in order to make that look any good. So that could well be a pro-only feature. But in terms of the performance, like you're not going to outperform the uh, iPhone 12 right now. I mean, you're not going to kind of hit the limits of what it can do in terms of its own A14 performance. So if it's a performance thing that you're worried about, I don't think you need to worry. There will always be new features. And at this point, we're well past that halfway point. So for me, if you care about the features, I would hold on. The Golden S asks, I cave answers. If a Mac Pro has a 3090 level performance, do you think they will make an 8K Pro XDR display? If a 3090 can do 8K gaming, then what stops them? Okay, so I don't think they're going to do a, a brand new 8K display anytime soon, uh, mainly because number one, Apple doesn't tend to release monitor after monitor after monitor. I do expect when the larger iMac arrives that they will make a display using exactly that panel that you can use as a standalone for something like a Mac Mini or if you wanted to use it with other stuff. As a secondary display for a MacBook Pro, for example, I think in terms of the gaming stuff, I think Apple is far more likely to push in towards the AR side of things where those 8K displays are right up next to your eyes. I don't think Apple is going to need to make an 8K desktop display anytime soon, at least. But in terms of gaming, yes, 100%. But still we come up against the same uh, stumbling point with gaming on the Mac is that developers need to support the Mac platform in order to make those games work on the Mac well. It's not just a case of Apple providing the hardware, which they've been doing for quite some time. It's a case of the, the developers actually noticing that enough people are moving over to the M1 platform and Apple Silicon in general and wanting to access that market. Slow Cuba asks, I gave answers regarding MacBook Pro 16 inch, Pricing, assuming Apple doesn't offer a discount for the M1Z 32 GPU MacBook Pro due to lower battery life, do you have any guesses to share about the price differential between M1X 16 GPU and the M1Z 32 GPU? 
So this is kind of assuming that we're going to have two different options that you can choose between for your 14 inch and your 16 inch. There's every possibility that the 14 inch will come with the 16 core GPU and the 16 inch will come with the 32 core GPU. So you'll get more graphics performance in the larger one and less in the smaller one. And that could be a limitation based on cooling or it could purely be to differentiate between them. So my thoughts are if they're going to put the mini LED displays in, the 14 inch will start at $17.99 or $18.99 and then $23.99 or $24.99 for the 16 inch. Um, I'm not sure that Apple will do an upgrade version between those two. I think they should because I don't think how big you want your screen should really dictate what level of performance you need because some people might need a lot of performance and be able to put it in a smaller backpack. We really won't know until we get it. Um, but I think it's going to be around about that $400 kind of price delta, four to $500 maybe. But I think that will be because you will also get the larger display included in that. But I don't think there'll be some sort of price discount for lower battery life. I think the battery life is going to be almost as good as it is on an M1 MacBook Pro. I think we're probably still looking at maybe 20 hours of battery because the physical batteries will be bigger. Alan B Unboxings and News asks, where can I watch the Apple WWDC 2021? Okay, so Apple makes it super easy for you on this. In general, there is a stream within the Apple TV Plus app or the Apple TV app on Apple TV. You can also generally watch it live streaming on YouTube and it will be on Apple's developer site, I think, although they normally make it pretty easy to find. There might well be a link on the front of apple.com, but if not, developer.apple.com will be the one. Uh, and we will, of course, be live streaming immediately after it on June the 7th, which is only a couple of weeks away now. Very exciting. And Vinay Spidey asks, will there be a 13-inch MacBook Pro update in the coming WWDC? So my thoughts on this one are no, I don't think they're going to update the 13-inch uh, at WWDC because that's going to be for the more performance level M1X processors, assuming that we get it, which everything's pointing to the fact that we will get MacBook Pros with M1X or M1Z or whatever it's going to be called. But the M1 MacBook Pro will keep that until... November, I think, October, November time, when we get M2, that base level one, it looks like it's going to get an update with that. I thought they were going to kill this one off and let the MacBook Airs keep the M2 level and MacBook Pros would get the X chips halfway through the year. But rumors are saying that we are going to get a 13 inch with M2. So I think that's when we're going to see the next update on it. Shantu Saha asks, IK answers, do you think that there will be any Intel Macs left in Apple's lineup by the end of this year? Also, I have an Intel MacBook Pro with Touch ID, currently use it docked with an external keyboard and mouse. Is there any information about whether Touch ID on the new wireless keyboards will work with non-M1 Macs? So we'll take these in order. It looks very much like the Touch ID keyboards will only work with M1 with Apple Silicon equipped Macs. And the reason for that is the way that the security and the secure enclave works. I don't believe it's going to be compatible with T2. I believe you'll be able to use the keyboard, but I don't think you'll be able to use the Touch ID sensor on it from what we're hearing. But remember, none of these are kind of out in the wild yet. Um, the only ones are with the Apple reviewers, people like iJustine, MKBHD, Brian Tong, Rennie Ritchie, all of those big names have got them to play with. We don't yet. And I don't believe anyone has tried it. But from all the information that I've seen, you won't be able to use it with a non-M1 or non-Apple Silicon Mac. Now, in terms of Intel Macs being available by the end of this year, I think the only one will probably be the Mac Pro. I'm still not convinced whether it's getting a, another release or not. And if it does, I think it will be very much just a refresh on the website. I don't think there's going to be any sort of fanfare around it and also the rumors are saying that it might be i9 equipped which makes very little sense because the whole point of the mac pro is that it uses xeon chips which allow it to use all of that ram i don't think an i9 can address one and a half terabytes of ram so that makes no sense to me uh, i would assume it's going to be xeon chips if it's not then i don't know why they're even bothering but i do think that once the uh, apple silicon macbook pros are released I think the original version is going to disappear off the website. And the same with the iMac with uh, Apple Silicon 
in the larger form factor, which we think probably 31 and a half inches. As soon as that comes out, I think the rest of the Intel uh, iMax will be disappearing. Neverdan asks, my cave answers, what are your thoughts on waiting for four nanometer slash three nanometer that will both likely be coming within 18 months? Well, for, for one thing, I don't think that we're gonna get three nanometer within 18 months. I think four nanometer is probably the node that will come in the A16 chips. Three nanometer, I think is a little bit further out than that. I know Apple has already booked in a huge chunk of what TSMC can do with their four nanometer stuff. I think almost the first year is going to be pretty much exclusive to Apple, but I also don't think it's going to make a difference about waiting for it. Most people, when they're using a computer, don't know what node the chips are built on. It doesn't make any difference to people. There will be more efficiency from using it. There will be the ability to pack more transistors into a die, but at the same time, there's always going to be something better around the corner. So waiting for it, doesn't really make too much sense unless you are just around the corner from it at this point when you're 18 months out buy what you need now and if something better comes resell apple stuff keeps its value really really well like even look at home pods you can't buy a used home pod for less than about 220 dollars uh even though they're 300 brand new and they've been out since 20 17 i think they just don't really drop value and the same as we've talked about in the past with macbooks they really hold their value. If you want to try and buy a used Mac Mini with M1 right now, you're probably still looking at over $500. I'd be very surprised if you can find one under that price, but you can get them for $599 quite often on Amazon, brand new. So you're really not dropping a lot of value. So buy what you need now, and if you want to trade up later, selling on the secondary market is a very good idea. Josh Carmichael, do you think that we will see the bigger iMac this summer along with the MacBook Pro and Mac Mini? Yep, yep, I do. I think that's gonna be here at WWDC as well. It just makes sense that they will release it, get it out the door so that we can kind of move on from the, uh, the dark days of Intel. Evan Rogers, IK Vances, now that we are finishing up the M1 rollout, which Apple M1 products are the best and the worst what a what an interesting question so i don't think there's any bad choices uh, i think that the macbook pro with the uh, 13 inch with m1 is probably the worst value um and it's difficult to say that because if you love that track uh, if you love the touch bar then that's a really good thing to buy for you i think the m1 macbook air is probably the best value in the range because you get that lovely keyboard you get the stunning display that you get on all of these things with the p3 wide color gamut you get great battery life you get your keyboard and your trackpad included and you get it for like under a thousand dollars that's just a great value there's nothing bad in the range like the mac mini that i bought this kind of setup here is basically around a thousand dollars as well this is probably a better value right here for a thousand dollars than you would get with the imac but at the same time I haven't got a webcam included in this. I haven't got a FaceTime camera. Uh, I had to buy my speakers separately. I had to buy these displays separately. And we've been through uh, how I built this for me, for what I do. This is a better value for most people. Buying an iMac, plugging in one cable and having everything ready to go is a much better value for them. I don't think there's any bad choices. As I say, I think the worst value is probably that MacBook Pro 13 inch because $300 extra over the MacBook Air just seems like a bit much to get the fan, a slightly brighter display, a slightly longer battery, and the touch bar. If those things are useful to you, then it's a good buy. Okay, we're going to leave it there, guys, but if you've got questions for the next show, hashtag IKVanswers down in the comments, and I'll answer them in the next one. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.